Today is the 30th of March 2018. This is Ginny Thwaite and I'm here with Mega and John Lamlash. The title of this broadcast is Memory and Madness, an update on the super learning event. Those of you who have followed the MED know that the super learning event came into play, but John did not elaborate. So we will return to this topic now and bring everyone up to speed. Good idea, wherever it came from. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, the super learning event, uh, it's a fetching notion. I mean, it's got a certain ring to it. I don't know, I find it quite attractive, even though I was the one who introduced it, or I guess I was. Uh, it has a certain flair to it that I like. So those who followed the Gnostic investigation of the Mandel effect know that it came up in the course of the investigation. Uh, and there was a point, I think there was just one talk, correct me if I'm wrong, where I brought in the subject of the nine muses and I suggested that everyone choose a muse. Oh, it's really important that you elaborate on that because lots of people who commented on your channel and the Ginny Thwaite channel were, um, you know, really stoked by that idea. And, you know, they declared, they de put some thunder outside, they declared um, which muse was theirs and then there was no real follow-up. So I, it's great that you're going to do that today. Yeah, follow-up in the... Planetary Tantra is not a sign, the, the failure or the lack of follow-up, which occurs from time to time, is not a sign of negligence or a sign that the practice is lacking. It's a sign of the astonishing abundance of the material that you have coming to you, coming through you, coming at you in PT. Wouldn't you attest to that? Yeah, and also a sign of super learning. That is super learning <laughs> itself, exactly. The mark of it is that you, the abundance of the material is always greater than you can handle. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of loose threads, there are, you know, themes. Uh, you know, it reminds, the situation reminds me somewhat of, of Castaneda. Um, you know, I've said that Carlos Castaneda's work is the warm-up act for planetary tantra. And there are many similarities and parallels, and some really significant tie-overs from Castaneda's work to Planetary Tantra. For instance, the boost of the Earth. He clearly stated the boost of the Earth in explicit terms, which I find to be beautiful and applicable. But also, uh, in the course of the years when I was reading Castaneda and discussing him with other people, there were nine or ten books in a row. And at one point I had the idea to make a just an itemized list of talking points in Castaneda, sort of like bullet points. I believe if anyone did that, and if you went through the nine or ten books, you would end up with at least 200, maybe 250 talking points. And you would find that some of them he never picked up again after he mentioned them. Like, for instance, one talking point was the square centimeter of chance. This is a Castaneda jargon. The warrior encounters the square centimeter of chance. And at that moment, the warrior is faced with making a decisive move. Well, he never elaborated on the square centimeter of chance. The other one, which I remember most clearly, he brought up in The Power of Dreaming, which is a magnificent book, in which uh, Don Juan starts out by saying, oh, yes. There are how many? Uh, 16 or 18 cores, C-O-R-E-S, abstract cores of this magic, of this neo taltech magic. Can't remember if it was 16 or 18. I think it was 18. There are 18 abstract cores. Well, this is a big statement of uh, Nahual language, right? And yet, did... Costinia to ever elaborate on those course? No. The same thing happens here frequently, doesn't it? We are just talking about that when you came yeah, in. Yeah, and it is a sign of abundance. And it also um, brings about the, the, the need for a kind of 
prioritization, um, which is according to you know your own skills and attributes, but also pleasure. What's what what is going to give you the greatest pleasure to take forward? Because these like ideas, they're sown like seeds out there, you know, and uh, someone's going to pick it up or you know or not. You can't keep up with it. Not at all. You could kind of compare it with a, a big gardening project. We've got a big garden going. We've got compost. We've got herbs. We've got flowers for beauty. We've got uh, the different kinds of vegetables. It's a permaculture project, which you would understand very well. We go into the garden and say, what are we going to tackle today? You can't do all, you can't work on the beds at the same time that you're working on the herbal plants. You know, you have like a an herbal garden that's like a sundial garden, you can't work on that at the same time that you're working on the compost or something else. It's similar to that, isn't it? Very similar, and that is actually a really beautiful and pertinent example because in that situation, to some extent, you're also guided by the weather and the seasons, you know, and what is the right time to do, you know, to do something, uh, which isn't just according to what you think you might want to do at that time. It have to be the right conditions. Yeah, and the weather in pure, uh, in the pure language of PTA, the weather in quotes is the emotional weather of the earth. And you can actually follow that weather through the Dakini shifts. And that's an essential part. One of the five or six fundamental practices of planetary tantra is following the lunar shifts. Then you, you go on the frequency of that shift, you know what her emotional weather is, her moods, and the particular band of intel that's going to be broadcasting during that shift. And that helps tremendously in deciding your priorities. So, back to the super learning event. Uh, it came up in the course of the Gnostic investigation. I did one talk on it, and now I'm going to go back and pick up those themes. Mainly, the theme drawn from Greek mythology of the Nine Muses. You know, now, when I brought this up, I have to ask you to a question. Uh, even though you're close allies and students, you might be able to give me a kind of reading on this from the viewpoint of, of students coming to the work, you know, because I'm so far inside it, I, I can't even see how it works for people outside. But for me, Greek mythology, uh, everything Greek, from the Greek tragedies uh, down to the Seder plays, is all second nature to me. So when I bring up the nine muses, and I say the nine muses are the daughters of Mnemosyne, that wonderful name, Mnemosyne, is the mother of the muses, and that name means really the synthesis of memory. This is something that I've got under, under my fingertips. It's like second nature to me. So, so when I bring it out, I'm not certain how it's going to play with people who've never heard it before. So it's the synthesis of human memory? It's the synthesis of cosmic and human memory. So the species memory. The species memory working inside and with her memory, which is a trans-species aeonic memory. It's kind of a... Um almost like a bizarre, well, no, this is typical of how these things work. When you bring up something like that, I have no, rec uh, you know, recollection of having read or heard about it before, but when I hear it for the first time, it's as though I'm remembering it. <laughs> this is a sign that we're on the right track, <laughs> and I count on that. I count on that, but at the same time, I'm wary of the chance or the odds that because of my own particular path of self-education, which has fortunately been very rich, that I've had the privilege to do this, that if I throw out a reference to the nine muses and I give the Greek names, someone's going to be like put off by that. You see what I mean? It's going to come as kind of alien information. It, it does. The, that's one of the things that people often say. Um, it, the, it's difficult tracking the foreign sounding names, whether it's the Greek names or the um, you know, the names of the, you know, the Dakinis or the Mahavidyas, that it, it, they, they sound unusual, you know, to us. Well, that happened in the GNA as well, didn't it? You know, people got blown out of the rigging because the astronomical terms you were coming up with and the Sanskrit terms you were coming up with was just, it was just too much. People would switch, couldn't, couldn't maintain the But that's level. The, this thing there is that, um, this is because how people are taught very often is to focus on the 
the you know the detail of something and that you know you can kind of let those things flow over you you don't have to learn the whole thing all at once um, you know it's like you learn herbalism you have, you're supposed to learn the whole thing well actually you will be shown what herb you need at the time you need it and so it's the same thing there you let it flow over you and then and then she comes back to you and then it's like oh uh -huh, that's the one that's applicable now that's a good rule I would say to those who don't particularly uh, fancy to these names immediately uh, don't be put off by them just take a neutral attitude toward them they're like hooks or cues and they will cue something in your subconscious or something in the depths of which you already know and that will naturally pr uh, present itself at a certain point and then you can go with that but you don't have to be uh, intimidated by these names I realize like right now we're going to review the super learning event I'm going to go through nine Greek names which with their corresponding or correlating Sanskrit names that's a lot of Greek Sanskrit jargon and I understand, now let me just say this to everyone that's out there listening. These are the conditions of the times, that's all. Consider these names as something like icons. You're being presented with a new operating system for your own mind and an operating system in which you can be interactive with the planetary intelligence. This is a big instrument panel. It's as if I sat you down in the cockpit of an airplane, isn't it? Look at, look at all those dials. There's a panel of dials above you, there's one in front of you, and there's one at your knees. There are all these gauges and everything, right? And I'm saying, now you're going to fly this plane, mm -hmm. right? The panel of the mothership. The panel of the mothership is the Shakti cluster, right? So, due to the conditions of the times, names have to be put on these instruments, but they're only provisional. We've already changed a good number of the names, Sanskrit names, of the Shakti cluster. That's why we like to say Tantra Mother and Miss Piggy rather than Vajrayogini. Uh, that's why we like to say Idris rather than Bhagavamukhi, because Bhagavamukhi is a Sanskrit word, it's a little bit awkward. And what was Swandeva's before you changed it? Nairatmya. Well, that's impossible. It's a little to hard to pronounce <laughs> Nairatmya, so we say it's Swandeva, which is more friendly. So. It's just the, the dressing, it's just the initial form. You have to draw from somewhere. Uh, planetary Tantra places you at the leading edge of a monumental process of recovery and reconstruction of the intelligence of our species. And you, you have to, the dials, I have to say, that's the fuel dial, that's the air pressure dial, that's the temperature dial, that's the radio frequency dial. Okay, don't get overwhelmed. Don't be intimidated. It's just the way that we proceed now in order to learn how to fly. Right? Clear enough? Yep, yes. So let's plunge into it then. When the super learning event came up, I proposed two practices for everyone who was intrigued by that notion. First practice was scan Drift back in your memory to when? When you were about 11 years old? About, about nine. Nine. The key moment is nine years, three months, if you want to be meticulous about it. But there's a window between eight and 11. Eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 is the latest you're going to go. Nine, 10 is ideal. Scan back and see if you can recall an incident at that time when something was presented to you by life itself in the form of a dream, an incident, a clue, a song. And that event was actually, at that time perhaps, you did not recognize it for what it was, or maybe you did. You know, I certainly recognized my event and I've described it. I did too. Yeah, do you? Tell me, what was your event? Um, a uh, primary school teacher um, essentially shutting me down, shutting down my creative writing um, ability, which I love doing. And um, she dismissed me and, uh, you know, it, it kind of uh, thwarted my desire to write. And express yourself. 
the next person. Yeah. yeah. What were you doing? Were you writing journals or? No, I was writing stories that would, you know, those exercise books you had at school. I, you know, I do, I do one story that would take up ten books. <laughs> and I absolutely, you know, it was, it was you know, it was, it was, it was, she shut down my imagination because that was what, you know, how can you fill 10 books if you're not running with your imagination? And she shut me down. So you had it at that time. You can identify when you scan back there that there was a powerful impulse or inspiration of some kind. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is what you want to look for in the past and, and retrieve that because that is going to be a clue to the learning path that you undertake in the super learning event. So you reprise or recapture something and bring it forward into the super learning event. That's the first part of the exercise. And the second part is choose a muse. Choose a muse. Because the muses are simply tags or icons for categorizing these different paths of learning. These different areas. Now, the passion to learn, the desire to learn, and the love of learning are innate to the Rome. If you look at the external system of the world, the school you went to, the schools we all went to, whether they be primary school or college, these institutions, having been corrupted by the Zenosh and their minions, do the exact opposite of what they should be doing, right? Yeah, well, education means to draw forth and it, they shut you down. It means to, it doesn't mean to indoctrinate and program you. Mm. It means to draw for, forth a ducere, that which is in the child. So the system doesn't provide this and in fact it thwarts it. When you return to super learning event, you recapture the passion to learn. Remember that in planetary tantra, you learn and you teach at the same time. Mm. You teach what you're learning. You share what you're learning. You don't wait until you learn something and you fill your cup with learning and then you go out and offer someone to drink from it. That's not the tantric way. So you share with it while your cup runneth over. That's more like the tantric way, wouldn't you say? Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the passion to learn, the love of learning, come back, but then you need direction. So I propose that everyone choose a muse just provisionally as a provisional tactic to give you direction. And I said explicitly that the choice of a muse, the naming of a muse is an NLP technique. Just by putting a name on it, you anchor that in your NLP, in your neuro linguistic circuits, and that anchoring allows you to concentrate and focus. So that was my proposal. Okay, um, it's confession time. Uh, we, you and I, John, had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, it escapes me why we were talking about it, but you said to me, and it really slapped me, and I went to bed that night thinking, oh. but whatever it was we were talking about, you said, well, that's because you haven't chosen your muse yet. And I was so shocked that he said that to me, and then more shocked that I hadn't actually chosen my muse as well. It was, you know, because sometimes I'm in it so deep that I can't um, see the wood for the trees as well. You're in it as deep as I am, and that's something that happens to us who are at that depth. Uh, it's very difficult to see it from outside, from outside, yes. So I'm really pleased that we're doing this conversation today because... Um, I will have picked my muse. <laughs> it's a Mickey Mouse technique, yeah. if you will excuse the allusion to Disney. Uh, a, a fair amount of the techniques in Planetary Tantra are what I call Mickey Mouse techniques. They appear to be very trivial, but actually they're not at all. They're extremely <laughs> profound. So it's, it's a trivial thing to just choose a muse. You know, <laughs> look over the list, and we look, we're going to look now, we're going to go down the list, and we're going to look at the paths of learning and the topics and themes that are associated with each one. So if you want to learn about, say, uh, the telluric sciences, geology, marine biology, and things like that, you go to Melpomene, that muse, and you choose that muse. You don't have to be involved in the deep understanding of uh, Greek mythology and folklore. It's just a tag that you put on something 
to give you direction. Is, is, that, is that clear? Yes. Good. So let's look at the list then. Starting at the top, remember, the Muses are the nine daughters of Mnemosyne, spelled M-N, begins with, and it's pronounced N, Mnemosyne. And Mnemosyne means the syn synthetic power of memory. The combination of the memory of the species, it's a threefold combination. Three again. Yeah, three, three, three. It's always thrice. <laughs> Personal memory, because what you have experienced in this individual body as a single creature is, re is re uh, stored in your personal memory, and that is significant to her. The species memory, which is accessible to shamans through phylogenetic recall, and the memory of the mother herself. So, what you need to remember when you turn your mind to the goddess of memory, the Greek goddess of memory, is that the operation of memory is threefold, and it's a threefold synthesis of memory. So, three times three is nine, hence the nine muses. And here we go. First muse is Calliope. Calliope. She is said to preside over languages, or semiotics, mimetics, and memetics, the poetic arts, everything that has to do with the expression of the human animal through language. Now, something I want to point out about language is that language is, and I describe this in my book, Twins and the Double, language is a doubling process. Every time you speak, you're involved in a doubling event. Why? Because if I say bookshelf, okay, I'm looking here at the bookshelf I built this morning. The bookshelf I built this morning has no name. It's just an object. If someone comes into this room and they have aphasia, which you may find yourself having at moments, and don't be freaked, it's a indication that you're neural disk is being deleted so it can be reprogrammed, okay? Uh, they won't be able to know what it is. They won't be able to call it a bookcase. So when I say, oh, that's a bookcase, what am I doing? I'm pairing and doubling the word with the object. So this is the nature of language. And the goddess in the Shakti cluster, the power in the Shakti cluster, correlates to that, is called Idris. Now this correlation, this compilation I'm making, is going to be available on the Charlotte Working page in a day or so, okay? So you can follow it. The point of this, uh, the point of this uh, uh, survey I'm doing right now, by the way, is not only to name the nine muses and describe their paths or themes or topics, but to correlate it to nine points in the Shakti cluster. So the Shakti cluster itself, which is what you said, the instrument panel for operating the mothership. planetary mothership, right, has 18 points, and there are nine muses. So naturally we think, well, what's the correlation? Are there two, mu are there two Shakti cluster points for each muse? Well, we'll find out. We'll answer that question when we do the compilation. So, clear so far? By the way, what you, uh, Mega, you're not particularly, when I brought up the super learning event, you weren't particularly keyed to the Greek background of that. It wasn't something that was familiar to you? No, no, not at all. For me, it was much more of a super sensory, um, you know, event. Um, so I would, I wasn't aware of this at all. I, I guess I would correlate it to, um, in some ways, similar to um, a telestic trance. The a trance? Yeah, yeah. How so? Because of all the information coming at times all at once. It's both um, imagery, mental imagery, um, physical, you know, bodily, you know, sensations, 
um, and Intel that brings those you know together and it and it happens at once and it comes at particular times and it comes in a big in, a, in that kind of rush and then it takes a little while to unpick it that's how I experience it I hadn't I didn't know you know I hadn't really looked at the background right so much it was just you were describing you described what I was experiencing and you and you use the power of language to name it <laughs> So what you're saying uh, is that it's all uh, being orchestrated by the lobsters. Uh, <laughs> so what you're saying, so what you're saying, is that uh, you took it in in like a trance-like state, and then it sorts itself out in your psyche, ex as it does in a telestic experience. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, the trance-like state of the telestic experience. What is that? It's not a you know, you're not in a state of demonic possession or anything like that. It's just a state of higher concentration, isn't it? Mm. Right. Okay. So, good enough. Proceeding. Muse number one, or the first one, Calliope. So, I've characterized each of the muses by certain initial suggestions or illusions of what their topics are. So if you're interested in languages or good at languages and like play with words and so forth, then perhaps Calliope would be your muse to choose. Okay? Are you using the Greek names? Yes. Do you think that's helpful? No, it isn't. No, so but, we use the names of the Shakti cluster. Right, so I'm proposing that going in, I'm going to give you all the Greek names, but I propose that you actually switch it to the names of the Shakti cluster. So Calliope becomes Idris, number eight in the Shakti cluster. Okay? Next. Uh, Cleo. Cleo was a daughter of the goddess of memory, and she was the tutelary guide. Tutelary means teacher or instructor in the realms of history or the cultural narratives. Uh, the stories of the different races how they evolved, what their particular lifestyle is, the, uh, the, the Irish race, the Italian race, the Japanese race. If you're interested in these different races and their behavioral profiles and customs, you would learn that under this muse, Cleo. Uh, and that muse correlates to Swan Deva, who is number 11 in the Shakti cluster. And we're in a Swandeva shift. And we are currently in a Swandeva shift and we are coming up to the midpoint of that shift, day 14, 15. So I'm speaking to you today, we're having this conversation in the, at the midpoint of the Swandeva shift. This is the planetary tantra jargon. And there's a, nick, a name for Swandeva, as you might have noticed by now, in PT, there are different names for these aspects of the planetary animal mother, simply because they are terms of affection, right? If you have an animal, a cat, do you just call it by one name? Do you call your cat, oh, Mouser? No, pets oh. always have loads of nicknames, don't Why they? do pets have loads of nicknames? Because it's affectionate. Because the affection that you feel for them expresses itself in different moods. Exactly the same for the planetary animal mother. So, and also, in some cases, these names are technical. So, Swan Deva can be called the story keeper. Now, all the other frequencies of the mother present different kinds of intel. There are specialized bands of instruction. What those in PT have detected over the years, since 2008, when these correlations were established, they were established in 2008, in October, is that uh, the Dakini instructions that come through the course of the year are of a technical sort regarding like medicine, botany, gardening, you name it, right? But they're not as such narratives. They're not narratives, but there is one frequency that presents narrative guidance, and that is Swan Deva. So we call her the story keeper. Hmm. 
So Swandeva corresponds to Cleo, and if she's your muse, you're going to have a lot of great stories going, and you're going to take an interest in the stories that uh, rule our lives and the narratives that guide the peoples. Okay? Next is Euterpe. We can call her Vudasi, that is 14 in the Shakti, Shakti cluster. So if you choose Euterpe as your guiding muse, use the term Vudasi, that is her Dakini name. This is a path of learning and instruction, practice, experimentation, trial and error in the shamanic and healing arts, mantike or mantik, just divination, and in the visual arts. So if you're someone who's attracted to the visual arts, be careful of the archontic aspects of those visual arts. Very, very dangerous. Photography, extremely dangerous. Okay? Uh, then you would perhaps choose Vudasi as your muse. Yeah, I work with um, Vudasi. Do I you? I chose Vudasi. Of course she does. Yeah. Shamanic healing arts. <laughs> right. The shamanic healing arts. That's yeah. right. Witchcraft. Yeah. The but witchcraft of the body, of the mind, the body-mind connection. I'm going to get to that in the second part of the talk coming up after I go through the list. Okay, I'm going to go through it kind of rapidly. Thalia. Now, you know, back in New York City and probably in many cities around the world, often a theater will be named Thalia, a movie theater or a performing arts theater. Because Thalia traditionally overlooked the performing arts. But there's a rather a switch. If you choose this muse, currently today, you can still say, okay, Thalia presides over the performing arts. Again, this is another very dubious area because what are the performing arts? What have they become? You know, all the arts have become terribly corrupted in our time, so be careful about that. But essentially, Thalia teaches about ethology and anthropology and in the psychology and magic of our species. The psychological magic of our species, you could say. And that is Matangi, number nine in the Shakti cluster. All these correlations are going to be on the Charlotte Working page. Matangi, a really powerful witch and instructor in the intricacies of magic. Now, next topic. Are you interested in geology, learning about plants, about crystals, how they work, the properties of crystals, the telluric sciences? If you want to study the different kinds of rock, what are the three kinds of rock? Sedimentary, igneous, and there's a third one that I can never remember, okay? What if you're interested in, say, megalithic sites and the acoustical and telluric properties of the energies in megalithic sites? Or if you're interested in marine biology, the, this line of instruction comes under melpomene, according to the Greek correlation. But for planetary tantra, this is merita, M-I-R-I-T-A, number five in the Shakti cluster. So merita is your muse. She also teaches about calendrics, the observation of the cycles of the year, the eight points of the year, the solstices and the equinoxes and the cross quarter days. So if you're interested in the ceremonies of the year, this is all part of Marita's instruction. Marita's polymath. Yes, and she's a polymath. Mm -hmm. Now, if you uh, are specifically attracted to or uh, fascinated by acoustics, by music, by music, if you're a musician, you like to play and jam, you like to compose music, if you're interested in acoustics and psychoacoustics, and also if you're interested in mathematics, because mathematics and music, true math and music are the same thing. There's also false or phony math, that's another subject. That's quantum mechanics, relativity theory, all that quackademic nonsense. Kinematics and dance. What's kinematics? Kinematics means, what is kinematics? I just put that in there. <laughs> What, what is that? I did it again, but I outed myself. Uh, what is that very popular YouTube documentary? Uh, it's not chimesis. It's 
kinematics, K-I-N-E-M-A-T-I-C-S. For instance, kinematics, here's an example. You put sand on a metal plate and you, you, you play music and the sand oh, takes right, okay, yeah. formation, geometrical formations. That's kinematics. Oh, right. Mm. Yeah. A bit of what you're going into, the chromatin antenna, mm. the fractal uh, operation of frequencies through DNA, that's kinematics. Mm -hmm. It's the geometrical properties of natural events, that's kinematics. Well done, John. Okay. If you're interested in that, you go to Terpsichore. That was the Greek goddess, but for us, it's Budevi. Budevi, number four in the Shakti cluster. Budevi means the goddess of the earth. Bu is the Sanskrit word for earth. Okay? Next, we go to the subject of uh, anatomy. Do you want to learn human anatomy? You're fascinated by how the body works, what the body organs are, the 8th and 16th meridian Chinese system, the chakras that are so popular in the new cage thinking. Uh, the erotic arts, you want to learn a little sex magic on the side, have a little side order of a little sex magic. Well, I'm going to tell you where to go for that. The musical arts, again, uh, there's an aspect of music that comes under this muse, who was called traditionally erato or erato, E-R-A-T-O. For that, in planetary tantra, you go to Kamala, the love and sex goddess in the Shakti cluster, number 10. So Kamala would be your muse if you undertook that path of learning. How am I doing so far? Good. Clear. Good. Only two left. Suppose you're interested in biology as such, in neurosciences. Epigenesis is the thing, isn't it? Epigenesis is the cat's pajamas. Epigenesis is a, a, a word that's heavy on our minds at the moment. Indeed. I would say, not exaggerating, the knowledge and command of epigenesis determines the survival of the human species. No question about it. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. And at some point, I've been working on this for a while. It's one of these things that nags me. I'm going to tell you about the epigenesis that has been achieved by a certain ethnic group of people, which accounts largely for their power. And they have an epigenesis, and the Rome doesn't have an epigenesis. If the mysteries hadn't been destroyed, if the Telestai had been allowed to continue with the mystery school education to teach humanity how to guide itself, then there would be an epigenesis of the Rome, but there isn't, and that is largely uh, accounts for the, the path of destruction that we're on today. Well, thank the goddess we have you then to teach us. The epigenesis. Genetics and certain aspects of alchemy. Yeah. Thank you. I accept that compliment. In the spirit it's given. For this you go to polyhymnia, but because that is an awkward and encumbering Greek term, you go to shodashi, who is number three in the Shakti cluster. So if you were to undertake, if you were to dedicate yourself right today, say today I, I listened to this talk on Radio Gaianim and I decided that my highest desire today is to learn what epigenics actually is in the true sense, then you would put yourself under the tutelage of Shodashi and you would continue. And by simply by making that token identification, you draw to yourself a recognition from the mother and you draw to yourself the superabundance of her wisdom because they don't call her wisdom Sophia for nothing. It's not just a trivial term, okay? So, Shodashi, which means sweet 16, it means 16, we call her sweet 16, is a powerful Dakini or Mahavidya of the Shakti cluster. Finally, they come to astronomy. Hmm. You have a taste for astronomy? Want to learn about the structure of the solar system? Planetary and sidereal cycles? Procession of the equinoxes, which I've taught now for going on for fuck knows how long. I don't even dare say. Okay. Procession of the equinoxes, the world ages, uh, astrophysics, and celestics. We 
which is a totally new form of astrology that I invented. You want to go there? That's the Muse Urania. But in planetary tantra, you go to band two, and that is Tara, T-A-R-A. She would then be your tutelary guide into that field of learning. So there you go, the nine muses in their totality. First time an inventory of them has ever been made in the whole history of the world. Uh, since, of course, the Greek period and in Greek education and in even, even in medieval education, these goddesses were used for exactly the same purpose I'm using them now, to provide guidelines for people to educate themselves. Because it's quite easy to get um lost and sidetracked in, in the sheer abundance of the of the learning potential that's 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 out there. And picking a muse doesn't actually mean you can't. You know, there's no there's no sense of what you're allowed or not allowed. There's you're no not confined sense. to that muse. No, no. Not confined. But sometimes when um and they, they overlap a lot, you you know, I look at many of the different areas, but sometimes when, you know, can be feel overwhelmed. It's a way. Of, it really helps with the feeling of overwhelmed. Like this links to that, and this links to that, and this links to that. Then what's the lens, and what's the and what what particular um, uh, subject? You know, way of looking at something. Do you want to call upon? And that's, I think, where the the muse really helps. In Precisely, that. they're like apertures mm. to look through, in order to focus on a field of material which is really massive and overwhelming, and no one, not even us can handle that without direction. And of course, every single subject that these muses cover have been polluted by history, by the Zenosh. I mean, I'm just looking at them now, and every single one of them has been polluted. It has, and thank you so much for bringing up that point, because in, in concluding this survey, before we go to the second part of this talk, I want to say, I want to emphasize, that the characteristic of the super learning event, there are two characteristics that tell you when you're in the super learning event. The first one is that you have a, an experience, you have a realization that everything that you were told about a subject is wrong. Everything you're told about geology is wrong. Everything you're told about ancient mythologic, mythologic sites, megalithic sites is wrong. Everything you've been told about Acoustics everything, and music. Everything you've been told about everything is wrong. Is wrong. Yeah. And when you realize that, there's sort of an, a collapse. It all collapses. It's like a controlled demolition. You become Tower 7, Building 7. Yeah, you, for a moment you, <laughs> you become pancake. Building 7, you right? You pancake. <laughs> yeah, and you just, you just go down. But then, as the smoke clears, you see something, a ray comes through, and you realize that you can relearn it instantly. The relearning is an instantaneous and extremely rapid process. You don't have to go back to square one and learn geology all, all over again. You just have to follow the right cues and clues. And we're not talking QAnon. And we're not talking QAnon and a lot of other psyops of that kind. So if you decide, for instance, to undertake one of these paths of learning again, the disposition to learn is something that you, it's a commitment you make. The goddess needs that commitment in order to work with you and teach you. Mm -hmm. You can't walk into a classroom where a thousand things are offered and say, oh, I don't know what I want. Well, you're not going to be able to benefit from any of that abundance. And secondly, once you make that commitment, then you can, your subconscious will re reveal and detect the clues that leads you to the super learning event, which is incredibly fast. Yeah, it's, like a, it, it's actually the commitment, it starts with a decision. It's a decision that, well, you know, and it's almost as if, well, no, not almost as if, it's exactly as is. You start getting the information regarding the decision of the path you've made before you've actually formulated the decision. That's right. Really, like but mind. the moment you formulate it, it becomes even yeah. more yeah. explicit, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah. implicitly working. 
it becomes even more explicit. And then she shows up moment. in your in your life mm. the things that you have decided you want to attract into your into your life. And I think I think probably I mean I'm just I said twenty minutes ago that I hadn't picked my muse. I looked at this bit of paper and I know my muse. Of there course. You go. Of course. And we were talking about this yesterday, weren't we? You know, when um I was talking to you about the first time I actually looked at um, Holocaust denial, I'd avoided it for a while, and it actually it was my obsession, that event in history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love history, particularly war history. I looked at that event, I finally... And as soon as I started listening to David Irving, I went, oh, right. Of course the Germans didn't do that, of mm -hmm. course. So like I pancaked, I was building Tower 7. I, and then you have to rebuild. It, it, you don't have to do it. It does it for you. You get rebuilt. One of the outstanding examples of the super learning event that has been operating already for some time is what happens. It, it can be seen in what happens when people come to historical revision, which is under... Swan Deva, because she yeah. guides, she's a story keeper. Yeah. That's your muse. The yeah. And go. actually, I took up writing again because of that experience. That's right. And wrote something that went viral, maybe. I don't yes, know. it did. Yes, it yeah. did. Um, so there's my muse. It was there in front of me all the time. There it was. He's the obvious. <laughs> He's the obvious. So, for instance, uh, if someone chooses, if you make the commitment, to look at historical revision, okay, then you would be making a commitment to Swan Deva and taking her as your muse. What happens typically? Well, I find for myself, I can speak for myself, and I think for other people as well, it takes about six to ten hours. If you just start to look at it, you have to know where to look, choose carefully. Everything that I thought I knew about World War II, Hitler, World War I, the Nazis, the story, you know, collapses like Building 7. It's like that, though. It's it just goes incredible. like that. Yeah. And suddenly the, the dust clears and suddenly you think, oh, it's so obvious that that never could have happened. And it's so obvious that there's another narrative that was happening, and now I'm on to that other narrative. And it's so clear. The other narrative is so solid and clear the way it comes through mm. once that demolition has happened. Well, That's a demonstration of <clears throat> super learning. Yeah. Yeah. Once the smoke clears, you're, you're so relieved. Of course. Not only is it not physically possible, but how could anybody do that to somebody else? And then you start to get really, really angry. Right. So who lied? And then and then you're and then you're away with it. That's right. But you know, John, you're a polymath. You teach many, many subjects. So you going through this list of nine muses, you know, these are all these are all subjects that you, you know intimately. Well, I've been speed dating them <laughs> since I was about fourteen. <laughs> so what about the other nine? <laughs> the other nine are the other nine aspects of the wisdom goddess that do not correlate to the nine muses. And that is the subject for a follow-up conversation. Yeah. So to conclude this conversation, we're at minute 45, we're going to bring it around and conclude it with a couple of other points. Well, one point, um, Mega and John, would you like to talk about the macro and micro increment? Love to. In fact, we were chatting up a storm about that just when you came in. Um, and I noted that that is a, a dimension of the super learning event. Uh, we can call it, the, we can say the super learning event has several fronts. Uh, and this is, well, for us right now, it's a major dimension. So, what would you say about that? Well, shall I give you the example that, uh, that we were talking about, which was the day I came in and said, where was Jupiter? <laughs> where is Jupiter, you know, right now? Um, because I was woken up at 4.04, uh, you know, this morning with an answer to something that I'd been mulling over, uh, you know, for a while. And it was, it, 
it was Jupiter and the increment, Jupiter showing the um, increase, which was something I was looking at with regard to hexagram 42, and that this is a key aspect of the, the guy in alchemy and how we're playing you know, into now learning our skills, learning the skills that we need to fulfil ourselves and how the situation we're in with the, um, the attacks against the Rome are actually what we are going to, we are using right now to recover our, our magical powers. And it was very, very specific. It was that um, uh, the snake tamer, um, well, we, I was considering the scenario of the, um, the archer, the snake tamer, the... Um, um, the scorpion and the... And right, the, and this the is a tableau in the sky to which... Of observable constellations. Of observable constellations to which uh, we frequently refer and uh, it played a huge role in the Gaia navigation experiment. It's actually a tableau in the sky of four constellations, the snake tamer, the archer, the scorpion, and the scales or balance that describes the... Uh, correction of the divine experiment yeah. right so we we go back to the celestial story in order to remind ourselves continually of the experiment that we're in yeah so you were reviewing this well I, yeah i've been considering it and i woke up at 404 with this image very clearly you know in my mind um with you know where is jupiter right now because there is something happening right now and what i was getting from it is that our our DNA, our, our DNA is being, um, this is the time when it can be altered, it is being released. Some of the, um, the unexpressed genes, and we'll probably talk about this a bit more in a, another time, are actually, are actually opening up. And it's a correlation, what the bit I didn't go on to say was that Birkeland Currents, DNA, it's the same. They're both. They're, you know, they, ex they're, they look exactly <laughs> they the same. They look the same. Yeah. They're both photonic, um, electromagnetic, and the snake tamer is a big sine wave, and that the all the electromagnetic um, pollution that we're experiencing right now, um, we are close to being able to turn that around to actually use use that to entrain. That to the earth and, and increase the availability of energy that uh, we're all going to be able to use um, to well to do to carry on yeah. the battle to carry yeah. forward the battle to because, win the battle yeah to win the battle because we are right now entering the battle don't let anybody convince you that we've already lost that humanity is already a write off remember Not at all. Not that at all. the message of the transhumanists is we are going to recreate humanity in our image the way that we like. You're expendable, you're obsolete. We are going to eliminate you. So fia us. Fia us. So fia us. That's their message. <laughs> but we don't fear them. We're ready to take them on. The battle has just begun. But the battle for the Rome to overcome the enemies of life in the Zenosh depends on the Rome recovering their true magical powers. The Shakti Cluster app is the tool for doing that. So you're speaking at once like a warrior and at the same time like a witch and a shamanic healer and an educator. Uh, a lot of what you do, which I've had the privilege to experience, uh, concerns uh, what I would call body-mind adjustments. You call it shamanic realignments. Mm. So what we are getting now, more and more, this is what we mean. Let's see if I can paraphrase what we mean by the micro-macro increment. This is the operative term, right? Mm. What is the micro-macro increment? Well, working with you and talking with you, I'm learning that, I'm learning the brilliance and importance of this word that is used in uh, EU plasma cosmology, scalar. Now, probably, if you've heard this word, you've heard it in a fear-mongering context, 
Scalar waves. Yeah, you may have heard that scalar waves, S-C-A-L-A-R, and scalar weapons are being used against us, and that's part of the globalist program to reduce the population and everything. I'm here to tell you, turn it completely around. Scalar is what we're going to use, like you've never seen before. Scalar, what is scalar? Scalar comes to you like this. Look at a Birkelin current. Go look at what it looks like. It's two strands intertwined. Go look at DNA. It's two strands intertwined. What are the Birkelin currents operating in the solar system and the universe compared to the DNA braid? They're the same on different scales, That's right. right? So the micro-macro inc increment means that the Rome takes on the battle by standing in between the macrocosm and the microcosm. And we learn how the two are interfacing and cooperating with each other, which is planetary tantra, which is interactive magic with Gaia. Mm -hmm. You were making a strange attractor shape then. Yes, and I'm making yeah. a strange attractor shape with my hand. That infinity shape, but it's not a perfect infinity symbol. One loop is very much smaller, the other loop is very much larger. What's in the small loop is those in the know, the Gnostics. What's in the large loop is those who will be led by those in the know, and then you have a world worth living in. So, increment came up. We were talking just when you came in. This is so beautiful. It's such powerful language about uh, intensity and magnification, right? Mm -hmm. So, what is, in, what is intensity or intensification? Well, it's something you experience when you come into PT, that's for sure, right? But uh, in terms of the biopsychic field of the Earth, it's the moment of the lunar increment every month. Spider Woman, Charlotte, Planetary Mother, is constantly working through and playing through the web of life. And there are moments when the spider woman pulls the web tight. The, the, the fiber of the web has to be tight, just like in your body. There has to be a certain tightness. The tubular superstructure of DNA depends on a tensegrity, doesn't it? Mm. A tightness. So she pulls the web tight once a month. We observe that moment. And I'm going to tell you in the next talk what that next moment is so you can all look forward to it because I suspect that some events proving the validity of the Charlotte working will occur during the next tensegrity moment. So, we, uh, I want you to paraphrase this with me. We just got to the point this morning before you came in where we were saying, what is Sophia doing and what is Stellate doing? Sophia is doing this intensification. She's pulling together the web of tensegrity, the web of life, and when she pulls it, then Thelite gives a magnification to what she does. Then she intensifies, gives another magnification. And that's the process that we're now beginning to pick up on. Yeah, the, the lunar increment you're talking the about. The lunar increment, yeah. yeah. Which we're going into now. Yes. Mm. And we were saying how it feels that it sometimes gets to the point where you, the intensity and the, the, the way it so occupies your your being you know in every aspect of your you know your life because like it's almost too much but then that's actually when you get to the the surrender and when you get to that surrender this is when you're you're completely upheld because you're that's where that's where the scalar aspect comes into it in our favor because when you're held in that moment and you can just make a little adjustment to aim that's then you have the boost of the earth with you. Yeah, so you really yeah, surrender. Yeah. In, in terms of planetary tantra, surrender is synonymous with integration. Mm. When you are integrating, what the planet offers you right now, there is a moment when you surrender to that overwhelming feeling, but then it comes back to you as a defined force. It's not giving up. It's surrender not giving up. Not... Surrender is not giving up. Mm. 
No. no. No black pills in this game. No black pills. No. Surrender doesn't mean surrender to the enemies of life. Surrender means uh, surrender to recognition of and surrender to the beauty and power of the mother of the earth itself. But that surrender is an act of empowerment, not an act of disempowerment. Right. So say a little bit as we close uh, about the bodywork aspect, because uh, we were saying when you came in that uh, it's difficult, and I've said this a number of times already, I think, it's difficult to see exactly what she's doing in the atmosphere. There are momentous adjustments and taking place in correction in the ionosphere, in the troposphere, in the crust of the earth, in the oceans, in the balance of the atmospheric gases. Sophia is operating and changing extremely rapidly this whole ensemble of events, much of which lies beyond human comprehension. However, we're seeing something now that when you attune your body-mind, you become more capable of grasping what she's doing on the macrocosmic scale. That's the macro-micro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you notice, um, we were talking about certain sensations, like, uh, I, you know, I'm always asking, what's, what's going on? I always ask, what am I looking for, you know? Um, and <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, I noticed I felt like my nose was sort of kind of twitching and like it was I always thought it was like moving across my face I knew it wasn't but it felt you know what is this and I was breathing in a in a particular way and so I went outside um and I noticed and what did I notice at that moment I noticed certain rocks a particular kind of rock so I look at these rocks and I think oh that's a an unusual kind of rock and I took a picture of it and then I went and looked up this rock and found it was a serpentinite rock and I discovered from that that I was living on a particular magnetic anomaly line, which is actually where the telluric currents come from. You know, they're, they're very, uh, they're stronger, you know, on those, on those magnetic lines. So this was an example of how, well, you know, with that animal communication, sometimes, you know, she's an animal, mm. the communication comes in your body. Mm. They might not say to you the words of my knee hurts or something like that. Well, it comes in all forms, the images, yeah. feelings, yeah. sensations, and it's words. Exactly the... But it's all body knowledge. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I had the same sen no sensation recently <laughs> for about a month now. That's gnosis. Yeah, it's real <laughs> gnosis. comes through the nose, right? Yeah. I would, like, put up my hand like this and I think, it's like my nose is itching, but it's not really itching. It's right here at the bridge, isn't it? Yeah, because it's that's above where, this bone. Yeah, because that's where you have the sphenoid and the um, epithenoid bones. They have the strongest concentration of magnetite in the body, which is actually a magnetic mineral, which make us pointing to the bone in between the eyebrows, yeah. just below the yeah. eyebrows. Bridge of the nose. Yeah. 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 So now, science, conventional contaminated science. Would have, would have you say, oh, we've been testing to see whether that's where, how you can tell direction. Now, maybe that will, you know, is part of it. But actually, it's connecting you into the telluric currents of the, of the Earth so that she can guide you and it's, it's part of the interface between the micro and macro. That's exactly how intimate it is. And that's exactly how DI works. So we're fielding now in our bodies the intel that is required of yourself Self-knowledge means body knowledge. It doesn't mean any bullshit about being an internal soul or an eternal deathless entity. You are already deathless by your participation in the web of life, but not in any other sense. Your ego is not deathless. In fact, your ego is living death. So get over it, right? But the body-mind intel, the familiarity with the processes of your own body is required to map what is happening at the cosmic level. You are not a human creature who can map what she's doing at the cosmic level and what Thelite is doing in magnification of her correction unless you can read your own body first, right? So do you want to talk about tinnitus a little bit here? Right. Tinnitus, we're close with that subject. It's a Subject that has a lot of confusion and prob it's very problematic. And tinnitus is, without question, uh, a torment for many people. Uh, 
I wanted to address the subject of tinnitus during the 64 talks of the Gnostic investigation. I have mentioned it, but I never got around to it. Why did I want to address it? Well, because it's fact that quite a few of those who were seriously following the Mandela effect were talking about tinnitus and they were saying, hold on a minute, wait a minute, uh, an, uh, an increase of tinnitus, which is, by the way, in pandemic, there's a pandemic increase of tinnitus on this planet ringing in the ears. That's a very great fact. But it also appears to be associated with certain people who were detecting the Mandela effect. In other words, those who said that they, who validated the effect and didn't dismiss it, you know, said, well, I'm also aware that I'm having a lot of tinnitus, you know. Very problematical. I'll just make this comment on it. Uh, the human animal has acoustic abilities that belong to the realm of the magical powers of the Rome. And there's a lot of interference against these acoustic abilities because they're so critical. One of them, for instance, is telepathy. We are all naturally and innately designed to be telepathic with each other. We don't need the fucking internet. We don't need telephones. We have telepathy with animals. Animals have their telepathy intact. I don't think they have tinnitus. They, you know, but we do because we're in, first of all, tinnitus is a problem of the environment and of the interference of microwave technology with our physiology. So some tinnitus, some of it, is due to the impact of that insidious microwave technology. So it's like uh, autism. There's vaccine caused autism and there's the natural... There's genuine autism. Genuine autism. Right, exactly. Subject coming up soon. So, <laughs> there is another kind of tinnitus which is indicative. It's positive. I would say it's positive because if you're suffering from this kind of in tinnitus... It's indicative that you are breaking out of the field of interference. So it's difficult to talk about tinnitus because in one respect, it's a symptom of the interference of the microwave technology. But in another way, it's a symptom of breaking out of it. Yeah, I would say um, if, you still, if you're still experiencing tinnitus, notice which ear it's coming in. If it's coming in, if the ear has changed, then... You're plugged in. Mm -hmm. Entrainment. Is that, what are you in, in training to? That's the operative. What you want to notice exactly is that you might have, say, tinnitus during the day or in the evening before going to sleep. I often have it really strong. It's really high pitched well, and it's continuous. You didn't, you didn't, you had very strong tinnitus that actually stopped you sleeping when you first started. Um, looking at the Mandela effect, that's when right. it got on your radar, and then you were like, "Oh, I know what this is." You ha you were suffering with tinnitus. I was when For I began to time, investigate. Yeah. When I began, the moment that I recognized that the Mandela effect was both the uh, evidence and instrument of her correction. The Ionic Mother has agency. She's hacked into the internet. She's uh, rewiring our neural circuits. All that jazz. I started to have incredibly powerful tinnitus like I'd never had in my life, okay? Remember, it's both the symptom of the interference of shortwave instruments, that is to say, an archontic interference, but at the same time, it's an indication that you're breaking out of that toward true psychoacoustic attunement to the frequencies of the earth. Mm. So you have to ride on that paradox. It's, it's a very difficult paradox. You see how problematic that is. But, I, but you have to stop. If you, if you suddenly get tinnitus, stop. Whatever it is you're doing, stop. And pay attention. Mm -hmm. Because there's something coming in there. This is a good rule. And the other rule, I'd like to reiterate what you just said. You may have a bout of tinnitus. It seems to come in bouts when it's stronger or less strong. What you want to listen for is when you hear a strong, pealing, bell-like signal in the left or right ear only. When you hear it in the left or right ear only, it means it's an incoming adjustment from the earth. Yeah. When you hear it in both ears and it's that overriding, irritating sound, that means that you're 
in the frequency for better or for worse and you just have to ride it out. Yeah. Brilliant that you brought that up. That's really the clue to how to uh, view this phenomena to our advantage. Yeah, change your outlook on what tinnitus is. Yes. Yeah. Well, that actually comes for all kinds of um, other health issues which might be a subject for another time. It's Right, it we're at one, really... one hour and ten minutes yeah. and we've touched on yeah. uh, some of those... Uh, we touched on a lot of stuff. But it's the realignment. It's the it's the entrainment to into her frequencies that mm, are beneficial. Mm. Indeed, it is the entrainment into her frequencies, the induction, the initiation into intimate connection with the planetary animal mother is a psychoacoustic event. Mm. All right, and the super learning event is that's one of the facets or dimensions of the super learning event as well. Mm. I had a, um, I was a yogi for many, many years. I grew up with yoga. My mother was a teacher, and somebody who was both our teacher, who I still really respect to this day, he used to tell us, you know, tinnitus is it's the universe tapping you on the shoulder, you know, pay attention. And it is the universe. It sounds but like a fact signal, doesn't earth. it? Yeah, yeah it yeah, sounds like a yeah, fact yeah, signal. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it's the earth and the universe. That's right. It's both. Yeah. So that's something to uh, see uh, positively and to not become paranoid and demoralized due to the very great fact that we know that we are in a toxic bath of shortwave frequencies. So, finally, we have another item on the agenda here, but I'm going to move it forward to the next talk because uh, an hour and ten minutes is really uh, pushing the limit here of these broadcasts. Uh, the next talk, soon, we're going to revisit the fascinating phenomenon of Sophianic baby talk, which is also a factor of the super learning event. And so we'll leave you with that teaser Radio Guyanian broadcasts are always cliffhangers, as you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> be mysterious. And? But keep it real. But keep it real. <laughs>